Welcome to A Basic Look, the show where we look at Dungeons & Dragons from a simple perspective. I'm your host, Wally. <clears throat> Today we have a special show for you. We have a guest who is willing to have a conversation with me about roleplay versus rules. Our guest is a music education major who enjoys playing Dungeons & Dragons. He currently plays in two different Dungeons & Dragons campaigns with two or three other players on the weekends when everybody has time. In one game, he plays a character who is a rogue, warlock, and wizard all in one. In the second game, his character is a monk and paladin all in one. He has read the entire player's handbook. He knows how to play power build if he wants to sometimes my annoyance. And he loves just thinking outside of the box. This man's name is Arthur. First, we're going to look about how role play can improve the rules as written. We're going to have Arthur look at listen to a soundbite and then we are going to have him respond to that. If you think about it, D&D is just like any other game. When a game is released, it's not perfect. You'll have a few bugs or glitches here and there. D&D is just the same way. It is the dungeon master's responsibility to find those issues and bend the rules to fix it. Okay, that's our first soundbite about bending the rules. What do you think about that? Uh, I definitely agree that there are certain times where role play should go over the rules. They should kind of break them. Um, there are many examples that I can go through, but let's see which ones you want. All right, that means I have control here. All right, first, we're just going to look at weapon damage types are one of the rules that just kind of drive me crazy. Especially with the uh, stabbing with a weapon that's usually a slashing weapon. For instance, in D&D, there are the rules of damage types. You can slash, there's slashing damage, and then there is piercing damage. Now, often they'll say a saber is just slashing damage, you know, like a cavalry saber. However, if you role play as, well, I'm stabbing them, I think it should be piercing. This is important because different creatures are resistant to slashing or piercing either direction. How about you? What what kind of weapons or kind of damage types bother you on that? Um, as your example said with the saber, um, there it can do all three. The one that you didn't say was bludgeoning. So what you can do is you can pierce with the tip of the sword, you can slash with a sword, or if you hit them with the flat part of the sword, you can also do bludgeoning damage. Um, that's more, for example, if you want to knock out the opponent instead of kill them. Uh, good for sparring matches. Um, another example, example is uh, like the rapier. It's more for piercing, but it can also be used for slashing, like you said. So there's just many examples with those types of weapons where they have it wrong. Spear, you can do bludgeoning with the bunt in, but also stab or slash with the tip. So just depends on what you're looking for. Which brings us to another one. And I believe we had a ruling about this in a game I was running is ranged weapons having disadvantage on all prone creatures. Because I believe we had a large creature, it's a manticore that was prone within 15 feet of somebody. Rules as written would have said they would have disadvantage. I said n no. Uh, yeah, that campaign, I. Don't know exactly 100% who used the ranged weapon, but uh, we did agree that if it's large, basically when you think of a large creature, it's over 10 feet at least is the bare minimum height, but normally they're like 15 feet large, all these things. I agree, there should not be a disadvantage. Uh, ranged weapons in general, this goes back to the first part of weapon attack. If they get too close, back in medieval times, they would just cut their bowstring and use it as staff. Same thing with this. Um, you can change it up a little bit. Uh, again, this is kind of more towards role play versus rules. Uh, game masters most of the time have 
the oversay of it. All right, that brings us actually right into the next deal of how a game master can change rules without players noticing. And a game master will kind of often break, quote-unquote break, it is their prerogative, break rules about monster and, like, non-player character stats. This kind of including adding health, armor, you know, abilities, and stuff like that. And just I was wanting to see how, if you thought this was all okay, you know, kind of, what abilities do you actually like to see changed on a monster? So a good example of this is there are certain monsters who do um, interesting effects. Uh, I think we fought a clay golem. It will permanently knock down your health, however much damage it dealt. It is curable, but it adds a little bit of difference to the game, to where normally like, oh, you knocked it down. Well, if they're having a lot of trouble with it, you might take away that ability temporarily and say, oh, it can only use it like once every other turn or something like that. You can slightly change it up to where your players aren't completely killed off because it's a little off. Um, that goes with things that are the NPC stats. They're called challenge ratings. Those are not exact. That is definitely a rule you need to break. Um, so <laughs> that's about the best example I can give for that. And how about on just like player characters, like your character in the game? Um, a good example of that would be, um, like um, you said, my paladin monk. Theoretically, a paladin is a religious person who they follow a religion, they follow their god and all that. Well, a monk, on the other hand, doesn't really believe in God. It's their more freedom, just enjoy life. I mean, there's a few that also believe, but they, uh, those can slightly interfere with each other. Um, or like a rogue with a paladin, that should never be able to mix, but it does. It depends on how your character plays with it. So there are rules for players to follow, but you can easily change them if you need to. But there is definitely too much to that. So we will, I can explain into further on that later if you need me to. Yeah, I believe that's going to be in our next topic, which we'll kind of move into next, is we've kind of covered some of the positives of role play overriding rules. And I just want to look at maybe when perhaps it shouldn't override the rules a lot of people don't like this idea even at all or some people believe this is the only way to play but we're just going to look at how it should be in between mm -hmm. and i think one reason personally to choose rules over role play is when it makes things too complicated and i'll let you kind of comment on like when is that true when is complicated too complicated so uh when it gets complicated, is like something you said earlier. I didn't think about it till we were talking. Is power building. There are definitely ways that you can overpower anything by adding certain classes together, certain weapon weapon damages together. I mean, you can easily do certain things that are terrible. Um, an example of this is like a rogue slash fighter. They work together. Fighter has action surge. Well, on the other hand, the rogue, if another creature is near it that's on your side, you get sneak damage every attack, so it would be too powerful. That's why a lot of times there's rules of you have to meet certain conditions to meet to multi-class into something else. Now, if those conditions are met, you technically aren't breaking the rules in any shape, way, or form, so you can do it. But you got to make sure, you know, there's got to be some rules or it will be completely complicated and chaotic. All right. Yeah, kind of you pretty much answered this, but we'll talk about it. Does allowing role play to override the rules constantly just make some players overpowered because of their just ability and natural real-life charisma? And is there kind of a way to balance that? Okay, so that is definitely true. Um, when it comes to power building, I do do it, but I try to also keep it balanced to where maybe I add something to it. For example, if you have a power build, 
you're probably just going to tank a lot of stuff or do so much damage, but you can add a little bit of problems to it. Like, uh, as you said, I was playing a wizard rogue warlock. Well, the rogue warlock part, they're one soul. The wizard is a whole nother soul, but they're trapped in a body. It adds a little bit of power to it, and it's a rule that you can't apply, but it's also role play. So rules and role play can definitely go together, but it adds a handicap to the power because you shouldn't have wizard spells, warlock spells, and rogue abilities all at the same time. So we just made it to where the wizard kind of fought as a separate entity inside the same body. Yeah, that was kind of an interesting situation, especially when uh, you couldn't choose which time you had which character. That's true, that's true. It was a curse, basically. And now we're just kind of going to go back, and I believe we have another soundbite, but first we're going to kind of introduce this. As stated, kind of, I think the Game Master can change abilities of characters and player characters, but just, and when is that too much? I believe we'll have our soundbite in a second here. If too many changes are made to the abilities, it will most likely ruin the roleplay experience. When facing encounters, the players should be given a challenge. If the encounters are made too easy or too challenging, then it will be no fun. All right, so how about that? So, yes, you can definitely change some things up. But uh, a good example of when the changes become too much or stuff like that is where if your players are doing extremely well, it's okay to, like, let's say they have a bunch of money. Increase the money a little bit. But don't make it to where they have to spend all of their money on just one thing. Add a little bit of handicap, but not too much. Um, when it comes to damaging, stuff like that, there are certain resistance that you can have. Resistance against bludgeoning, slashing, all that. Poison damages and stuff like that. And you can even have immunities to it. The problem is where, like, they're completely immune to all type of elemental attacks or all physical attacks. They are completely immune. That works, but you have to know your parties where they can stand with that. If you have a group full of just fighters, rogues, stuff like that, and they don't really have spellcasting abilities, probably a very bad idea to change a character to where they are completely immune to physical attacks. There's not much they can do against it. You just kind of got to know where they are. I mean, that'll play also into how the Dungeon Master, what items that rogue would have, like if they have a magical dagger. And that can be balanced that way if they want a particularly challenging fight, but like the creature doesn't have much damage. Would that kind of be, like where you have to think about the combat? Yeah, so... There are ways to, like, if you enjoy making, like, special circumstances to make things harder for them, make sure that they have a way to get out of it. For example, stabbing, slashing, stuff like that. If you're making it to where it's only magical attacks, don't be afraid to give them a magical weapon. But, at the same time, rule says that you can give them to them any time, as long as they've earned it or something like that. You can change the rarity, all that. But this also goes into the same thing. If you give them too much, they're going to become too overpowered. There is definitely a balance with following the rules. That's why a lot of people just say, I bend the rules. Break the rules. Because the rules are definitely necessary in some aspects, or it becomes completely chaotic. But if you have it to where you just follow the rules, it could come back to bite you just as hard. you got to be able to mix with roleplay, and the rules, be able to bend on both a little bit. Yeah, that's probably like an agreed upon thing, usually eventually during the campaign between Game Master and players. Mm -hmm. Now, we're going to just look at one thing, and I'm just going to ask you a broad question here. You know, what is the time, you know, you've seen that rules should probably override or prevail against role play in your opinion is there an example you have on that one so 
or vice versa. Okay. Um, I think I might have one for both. I'll start with the when role play should outdo the rules. For example, um, you're having fun, everything else, and you want to, I don't know, use fireball on a creature. In the rules, if it says it dies, it just dies. Something that you can definitely do to increase the role play. It's not a rule. It's not technically against the rules. It's just something to definitely overpower with the role play. It's just something fun that they can do. If you kill the creature and the person knows, hey, roll for damage, and then it kills it, get, let them select how it happens with what they were doing. Like a fireball, for example. If it hits and it'll kill it because it's failed its save or something like that, say it caused it to completely go flying or something like that, the player gets to choose how it died. It's a fun way for role play to add this, uh, some stuff. And the rules, it just says it dies. You can change that to where it's more role play. Definitely add some more flair to it. Definitely a lot more fun. When the rule should prevent over role play, that one's a little harder. But uh, a good example for role play outdoing it is, um, or not role play outdoing it, rules outdoing it. The rule, I believe it is, is that a character's, dang, I believe a character cannot, do like certain um, spells there I think it's like power word kill it's this is before 5e edition creatures sometimes have it the problem with power word kill is it can instantly kill anything so in the rules in the new 5e edition you can't really get that spell unless you are extremely powered like level 20 by the time you get to that point you're gonna have bosses to where power word kill might work but there are certain rules that you have to make sure, like spells. Make it to where there is 100% conditions to get something, or at, there are rules that you just can't break. A good example of this also is at each tabletop you go to, there are rules that you do not break. For example, um, a bard is something that always tries to, due to memes, tries to sleep with somebody or something. But they add a rule, don't try to sleep with each other's characters and stuff like that. It's just something that you must follow. Alrighty, I would, I would love to talk a lot longer about D and D because we could probably sit here and talk most of the day, but today we have a time limit, and maybe, just maybe, I can convince author to start a show about D and D with me next semester, or a podcast. We'll see. Until then, guys, why don't we try to subscribe to NWTV Seven? Maybe next semester you'll get to see us again. Who knows? <laughs>